Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, today's webinar in the Clinical Trials Methodology Course 2016 series. The topic for today's presentation is what you need to know before talking to your statistician about sample size. Everyone but our presenter today will be muted. This is to prevent any feedback during the presentation, um, but we would like the webinar to be interactive, so we do encourage questions. If you do have a question, you can use the Request to Interact Live button. It's at the top right, and it kind of looks like a hand. Um, if you press that, um, I can grant you the microphone in order for you to uh, ask your question. There is a five second delay when you do get the microphone, um, but after that, everyone will be able to hear you, and if you have your um, video camera on, everyone will be able to see you as well. You can use the Q&A box to also type in questions. There's a event chat box. Um, it looks like a speech bubble at the top right under the hand button. Um, and that uh, contains a link that you can download um, for discussion later on in the webinar. If you're interested in CMEs, you must complete an evaluation form. Um, there'll be details at the end of the webinar regarding this, um, but you should also be able to see a little tagline that's broadcasted across your screen, and that's the link you're going to use. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Yeats is an Associate Professor of Biostatistics at the Medical University of South Carolina. She's a faculty member with the Data Coordination Unit, an NIH-funded statistical and data coordinating center that specializes in the design and coordination of multi-center clinical trials. As the PI of the Statistics and Data Management Center for the Phase 1 and 2 trials for deferoxamine and ICH, uh, Dr. Yeats is responsible for the des design of the trial and the implement implementation of the statistical and data project management work scope. She's also the PI of the National Data Management Center for Diffuse 3, which is a multi-center uh, clinical trial using adaptive design to assess the efficacy of endovascular therapy following imaging evaluation and ischemic stroke. In addition, she's also the primary unblinded statistician for the Interventional Management of Stroke Trial, IMS-3, and the Progesterone and Traumatic Brain Injury Trial, which is PROTECT. As a co-investigator on these grants, she was responsible for the statistical monitoring of data and the implementation of interim and final efficacy and safety analysis. She also serves as data and safety monitoring boards and is a grant reviewer for several uh, funding agencies. Her primary research interests include the development and implementation of uh, efficient early phase trial designs and not novel trial outcomes. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Yeats. Thanks, Jenna. Um, I always think those introductions are awkward in person and they're even worse on the webinar. Um, so th thank you all for listening to all of that. So I am going to talk to you a little bit today about um, the factors that go into determining sample size when you're meeting with your statistical collaborator. Um, I We'll start um, with the disclosures that are required since you all, um, some of you will be getting CME credit. Um, I am on the steering committee for the PRISMS trial and I do receive consultant fees from Genentech for that role. Um, but one of the nice things about being a statistician, I don't really have any interest in talking about unlabeled use of commercial products or investigational use. Um, so this presentation is not going to include any of that. Now, it is noon on a Friday, and I know that's a hard time um, for a lecture, and it's a really hard time for a lecture on statistics. Um, I hope that we will keep this light and informative and feel free to ask questions as you have them. But I am going to start out by showing you sort of a tongue-in-cheek example of what not to do or how not to go about that conversation um, with your statistical collaborator. There are lots of these videos um, on YouTube. If you haven't seen them, I encourage you when you need a laugh to take a look, but um, I'm going to play this one, which um, basically is a representation of the type of interaction that I have had and many of my statistical colleagues have had um, with our investigators who maybe when we first get to talk to them just don't get how complicated this discussion might be. Hopefully this will play. I have a study and I need to know how many patients I need. I think I only need three patients. Okay, what kind of study is it? I'm doing a lab study. Can I just use three patients? That depends. What are you trying to show? 
we always use three patients. Okay, what are you trying to show? I'm trying to show that drug A and drug B are better than only drug A. How are you measuring if it is better? We are looking at apoptosis. Can we just use three patients? What kind of measure of apoptosis? Do you know how variable that measure is? We always use three patients. That is what we have published before. Three patients per group or in total? Yes. Okay, let's try something different. What type of measure are you using? And is this an in vitro study? An in vivo mouse study? It is an in vitro study of patient samples, and we are looking at measures of apoptosis after treatment with drug A and drug B versus drug A and control. And drug B alone. Oh, how many groups are you analyzing altogether then? My grant is due tomorrow. I just need to know if I can just use three patients per group. Okay, well, you probably should have come to me earlier for help with this. All I need you to do is tell me that three patients are okay. So, it is not that easy. Your marker for apoptosis may have a large amount of variability associated with it that could make it difficult to ascertain differences based only on three patients per group. It also depends on what kind of outcomes you are looking at. Are you looking at normalized changes in expression levels from baseline? Three patients may not be sufficient to detect differences in these expression levels between the different treatment groups. I do not understand. I'm saying that you may need more than three patients per group, but that I need more information to determine that. The serine protease granzyme B is made in cytotoxic lymphocytes, where it is inactive due to the low pH of the storage granules. It is measured immediately upon delivery into target cell cytoplasms, where the pH is neutral. This is followed by cleavage of Proctus phase 3 by granzyme B in the target cell cytoplasm and the subsequent induction of apoptosis. All proteolytic events can be quantitated at the live single cell level by flow cytometry and imaged by confocal microscopy. I understand very little of what you just said. Maybe we should talk more about this. I just need to know if three patients are enough. My grant is due tomorrow. We will need to meet to better understand this before we can determine the appropriate sample size. I can put you on my grant for half of a percent FDE. You can design and analyze the data later. Do you really think that is enough to do the work? Well, it may be less if it is awarded and the budget is cut. Please go away. Okay, so of course, um, none of the statistical folks that you'll meet through this course or hopefully at your institutions would ever tell you to please go away. Um, but again, this, these are the sorts of um, conversations that we sometimes have with investigators. So I do hope that what you'll get um, from this talk is sort of a sense as to all of the components that go into this discussion. Um, but perhaps even more importantly is an understanding that um, it's not likely to be a two-minute answer um, for most experimental designs. Unless you've been working with a particular collaborator for a lengthy period of time and they're already familiar with the disease area and the types of experiments that you do, the types of outcomes you're studying and so forth, um, there's likely to be a lot of back and forth that go into this dialogue. I would like to make a disclaimer before we get started. Um, this talk is geared towards the design of a superiority trial, and I am using that term a little bit loosely. Um, in many cases, we think about superiority as being a phase three clinical trial where we're trying to show definitive efficacy of one treatment over another. Um, in this case, I'm talking about a two-arm randomized study where the intention is to show that one treatment is better than the other with regard to the primary outcome. But that primary outcome does not have to be clinical efficacy. It might be a surrogate outcome measure. It might be a biomarker um, or just some proof of concept that tells you that the intervention is affecting the target that you intend. 
And again, I'm talking about, um, in the case of a superiority trial, I'm talking about the situation where the deliverable, the end game that you want is the p-value that results from a hypothesis test comparing those two arms. That is by no means to say that this is the only sort of trial design there is, or even that it is the most relevant for you and each of your projects. There are lots of other trial designs where the objective is something other than a superiority demonstration. Um, in neurology right now, the phase two futility design um, has been getting a lot more attention. Um, in the phase three setting, if there is already a standard of care intervention available, you might be interested in demonstrating that a new intervention is not inferior to that standard. Um, so there are lots of different approaches that you can take. And the p-value is not the be-all, end-all as far as a deliverable goes. It might be that you're interested in estimating the precision of an outcome or that at the end of the day, the piece of information that you need is the selection of a particular intervention that looks most promising or the um, identification of a region of doses that looks biologically active. So there are lots of different approaches. I could do a whole semester long class and not cover all of the possibilities available to you. Um, but I do want you to know that some of those designs do exist and some of the factors that we're gonna talk about here may be more or less relevant or not relevant at all in some of those other designs. So why do we worry about power and sample size? In many discussions with junior investigators, it is sort of a, um, a last minute thought, of, oh, I have to justify this. Um, and I would argue that it really needs to be something that is considered on the front end of your experimental design, because what we're really looking for here is a sample size that provides assurance that the trial has a reasonable probability of being conclusive, okay? Um, our resources are not infinite. Um, NIH does not have money to cover all of the interesting questions. There are not enough patients in each disease area to cover all of the potential treatments. So we really need to focus our efforts and looking at the power and the sample size up front allows us to determine the sample size that's really necessary to answer the question so that we can efficiently allocate those resources. And of course, there are ethical issues as well. So if a clinical trial is too large, then we're needlessly exposing some subjects to intervention um, when we could have answered the question with fewer subjects. And again, that's taking up resources that could be spent in other disease areas or in the development of other potential therapies. On the other hand, a study that's too small implies um, a potential for misleading conclusions. And so again, I would argue that that's unnecessary er experimentation. If the power that's associated with your study is only 50%, so if the treatment works, you, your chances of declaring that it's effective is no better than a coin flip, then I would argue that, again, you're unnecessarily exposing subjects to treatment um, and not providing, at the end of the day, information that's going to move the state of the science forward. So we're going to talk about a handful of factors that go into the determination of the sample size that you need. And some of these are statistical and some of these are a little bit more clinical. Uh, we'll start with the level of significance or the alpha level. And that should be pre-specified by you as an investigator um, during the trial design stage, actually. The power, again, is going to be something that you're going to specify. It's the power that you're um, sizing your study to target. And then we'll talk about the minimum scientifically important difference. And this is a key factor that goes in. Um, and the point I wanna make here is that it's not always an easy determination, but it's also a clinical question and not a statistical question. So it's important that you as an investigator are aware of the literature and what differences have been targeted in the past in your disease area, and that you have an understanding of what are the potential harms that are associated with your treatment? What are the potential costs that are associated with your treatment? And sort of do what you can to factor that into your selection of the minimum scientifically important difference. The variability in the response or the outcome measure that you've selected is a key component in determining the sample size. And we'll talk about what we mean by that depending on the type of outcome that we have. <clears throat> 
And then the experimental design, of course, plays a role. Again, I'm focusing here on superiority, um, but there are potentially other designs that might influence the efficiency of your trial. And I'll briefly mention some of those possibilities. But again, the sample size discussion is gonna be geared towards a two arm concurrently controlled um, superiority study. So first things first, what's the research question? During your elevator talks, you all were um, very convincing in your small groups and you were able to state the background of the science and state the research question in terms that other scientific investigators can understand. But in order to have this conversation, um, you and the statistician are going to have to work together to take that research question and formulate it in a testable hypothesis. And that hypothesis is gonna be very specific. Um, we're going to want to know what the population is that you're studying, what's the response variable that you're looking at, what are you comparing, um, and at what time point are you making that comparison. So if you're assessing, say, the modified Rankine scale at three, six, nine, and 12 months, is your primary hypothesis related to the three-month modified Rankine, or are you going to be simultaneously comparing the treatments at all four? of those time points, okay? So we wanna be as specific as we can about that because it's gonna give the statistician um, a thought process or an, an alley to go down as far as the analysis is concerned, and that's going to affect your statistical um, sample size as well. So when you have that meeting and you're talking with the statistician about your research hypothesis, what we're going to do is we're going to take what you can state as your research question in words, and we're gonna turn it into two statistical hypotheses. These hypotheses are intended to reflect two states of nature. And it's important to understand that those are the only two possible explanations that we are considering when we're doing this. So the alternative hypothesis is usually the easiest to come up with, right? That's the statement that you hope to conclude at the end of the trial, right? In many cases, the end result that we're hoping for is the intervention affects the outcome. The null hypothesis is the converse of that. So the intervention does not affect the outcome. It's sort of the status quo, nothing unusual is occurring. You administer this intervention and absolutely nothing happens. And what statistics allows us to do then is to test your hypothesis through proof by contradiction. Um, you may remember this concept from some of your math classes in college, uh, but the idea here is that we're gonna conceptualize nature as being in one state or the other. So either the null hypothesis is true or the alternative hypothesis is true. We collect data from the real world through the protocol that you've outlined for your trial. And then if random noise or measurement error or chance, whatever you wanna call it, can account for those observations or is a reasonable explanation for what you've observed, then there's no need to formulate a more complicated explanation, right? So if what you've observed is pretty likely under the scenario where the um, intervention doesn't impact outcome, then we're going to choose to stick with that original assumption. We're gonna stick with the status quo. But if the data clearly contradict the null hypothesis, then we trust the data and conclude that the alternative must be true, okay? This is why a clinical trial is sort of the gold standard. Because we've randomized subjects to intervention, if there is a difference in the outcomes, the intervention, we believe the intervention must be the cause of that difference, right? But again, the data need to be strong enough to clearly con contradict the null hypothesis. You can think about that in, um, in the sense of uh, the legal system, right? Uh, we want to reject the null beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay, so we have two hypotheses. We focus on the null in statistics. And so the true state of the null hypothesis is either true, the intervention doesn't work, or it's false, it does. Those are the only possibilities. And we're allowed to make only two decisions, okay? We can either reject the null 
and conclude the alternative that the intervention works, or we fail to reject the null and conclude that there is insufficient evidence to conclude the alternative. Notice that accepting the alternative is not a possible decision, okay? Um, in statistics, the only option is to reject the null. Proving that two things are the same, it turns out, is much harder than proving that two things are different. And so if that's what your trial is related to, you want to prove that two things are the same in terms of um, adverse event profile or outcomes or whatever, um, then we're talking about an equivalence trial. And again, our approach would be just a little bit different. Okay, so there are, if there are two true states of the null hypothesis and two possible decisions that we could make, then there are two correct decisions and two errors, right? If the null hypothesis is true, which means the intervention doesn't work, and we fail to reject the null hypothesis, right? That's a good decision. It's not a very exciting decision, but it's a good decision. If the null hypothesis is true, the intervention doesn't work, and we reject the null hypothesis and conclude the alternative, then we've made a type one error, right? We can think of that in the, superior, in the case of superiority as a false positive, right? The intervention doesn't impact outcome, but at the end of the trial, we conclude that it works. So we don't want that to happen very often, right? We wanna restrict the likelihood that that happens. And we do that by setting in advance of our trial, the level of significance or the alpha level to something small. If the null hypothesis is false, meaning that the intervention works, and at the end of the trial, we reject the null hypothesis and conclude the alternative, that's related to the power of our trial, okay? Again, that's a good decision. The intervention works, we're able to show that it works. We write up fabulous papers, which are published in JAMA and the New England Journal. Um, we're invited to give presentations all over the world. Um, it's, a, it's a good thing. And we want that to happen with high probability. And so we target a high power. And we'll talk in just a bit, uh, in just a minute about choices for both the level of significance and the power. Now, if the null hypothesis is false and you reject it, that's a good decision, right? But if the null hypothesis is false and you fail to reject it, then that's an error. And we want that to happen again with low probability. We don't often think about restricting the type two error, which is really what we're doing in that case. Um, but we think instead about setting a high power. These are related, in fact, because these are the only two possible decisions that you can make when the null hypothesis is false. And so setting the power high um, consequently sets the type two error rate or beta low. Okay, the level of significance, we'll start there. Um, the interpretation of the level of significance is very important. So the level of significance in a superiority trial gives you the false positive rate that you are willing to accept. Okay. So the interpretation is that even when the null hypothesis is true, even when the intervention does absolutely nothing, you're going to find a difference between the arms alpha times 100% of the time. Okay. Uh, the typical alpha level that's used is 5%, um, but that's not a magical number. There is nothing anywhere that says that you have to use 5%. It is said that you have to pre-specify it in the trial design stage. It is statistical cheating to conduct a hypothesis test, get a p-value, and then decide what alpha level you're going to test it against. So you wanna pre-specify your level of significance in the design stage based on what you understand to be the consequences of making that type one error. So how often are you willing to accept a false positive? Um, there are lots of things that might go into this, right? So if you are testing a surgical intervention against medical management, right? So there is inherent risk associated with the surgery that is not associated with the medical management arm. So that might play into your decision. If you falsely conclude that surgery works and you understand that these risks associated with surgery are pretty severe, 
you might want to restrict the likelihood that you ch falsely choose surgery over medical management. So you might not want to use alpha of 0.05, you might want to use alpha of 0.01, okay? Um, if you are instead comparing um, an, ex uh, an experiment where you are comparing um, cardiovascular exercise versus nothing, right? Um, it's hard to imagine what the what the consequences would be, what the um, poor consequences would be, I'll say, of incorrectly saying that cardiovascular exercise is better for weight loss, right? We know there are other health benefits. It's hard to imagine that it might be harmful in most populations. So you might not need a 0.05 level of significance. You might be willing to accept 0.1. Okay, so again, 0.05 is not a magical number by any stretch of the imagination. So as an investigator, I encourage you to really think through what the consequences of that false positive decision are and use that when you're trying to set up your level of significance. Now, when I show you what the level of significance really means, um, I'm going to use a one-sided alternative hypothesis, meaning we're only trying to show that the intervention is better than the control. Um, you, in most cases, we actually set it up two-sided, so we're trying to show that the intervention is different than the control, and that's fine. What we're talking about is the same. It's just that the shaded regions will be a little smaller because they will appear on both sides of this curve, okay? Well, what I'm showing you here is a one-sided alpha level of 0.1. So it turns out that when we think through our statistical approach, our focus is on the null hypothesis, and that's because we understand through statistical theory what the distribution of possible outcomes for the study would be when there's no difference between the treatment arms. Um, in most cases, we can um, write out what that distribution looks like very easily. And in many cases, it turns out it looks a lot like a normal curve. So what I've shown you here is a normal distribution, okay? And the shaded area here represents that false positive region. So if there is nothing happening, if the intervention does not work, then any outcome that you observe that is that falls within the shaded region, we would consider to be sufficiently rare under the null hypothesis that it would lead us to conclude the alternative. Does that make sense? I don't see any furious typing in the chat window, so I'm hoping that that makes sense. So this shaded region here right now represents 10% because we have an alpha level of 0.1. It represents 10% of the frequencies associated with our null distribution, okay? If I decrease the alpha level, so I go from the one-sided alpha of 0.1 that I'm showing you now to a one-sided alpha of 0.05, which is sort of typical, what you'll see is that that shaded region gets smaller, meaning the range of outcomes that lead us to conclude the alternative gets smaller, okay? again. We're decreasing our willingness to accept a false positive. So we're making it more difficult to make that decision. And if I further decrease it from alpha 0.05 to a one-sided alpha 0.01, again, that shaded area gets even smaller, okay? So this is going to impact how your sample size turns out because the level of significance is also related to the power of your study. So I'll ask you to remember that null curve that we just looked at when we get to the power curve um, on the next slide. So the power is the probability that a statistical test will reject the null and conclude the alternative when the null hypothesis is false. Okay. So it's important to note that you can't come up with a global power statement. The power that you can achieve in any given trial is specific to a specified treatment effect. So the interpretation of the power has to be tied to that treatment effect or the clinically important difference, which we'll talk about in a minute. So for a given value under the alternative, for a specified treatment effect, 
you're going to reject the null in favor of the alternative one minus beta times 100% of the time, okay? Whereas the alpha level is pre-specified at the beginning, we can inflate or deflate the sample size in order to impact the power. Okay, so how do the level of significance and the power play into each other? So remember I told you that we know what the distribution of outcomes looks like under the null hypothesis, right? That's this curve here on the left. And again, the shaded region represents um, what we call the rejection region for a one-sided alpha level of 0.1, okay? The curve on the right is targeting that um, specified value under the alternative or the treatment effect that you're looking at, right? So here, I'm trying to tell the difference between whether my outcomes are generated from this distribution on the right or this distribution on the left, okay? Again, the shaded region pertains to that rejection region for a one-sided level of significance, 0 0.10. So what you'll see is that the shaded region under the curve on the right, in the case of an alpha level of 0 0.1, is quite high, right? More than, certainly more than 50% of the curve is shaded for that rejection region. But as I change the alpha level, so I, if I decrease my alpha level, I um, decrease my rejection region, my shaded area decreases, and it also impacts the shaded area under the alternative hypothesis, okay? So again, as I decrease my alpha for the same difference under the alternative, I'm also decreasing my power, okay? or I would have to increase my sample size in order to maintain the power that I'm looking for. So again, all of these, um, all of these factors are sort of related to each other. And what's nice about that is that it gives you a lot of potential combinations to consider when you're designing the study, right? And you really should consider all of these possible scenarios so that you can defend the decisions that you're making. Okay, so what I showed you on the previous slide was for a fixed but generic treatment effect, right? And the question that we're asked many times during that first co um, consultation is, well, what is the treatment effect? What should I be looking for? We refer to this, I'm referring to it here as the minimum scientifically important difference um, because not all of you are using clinical outcomes, but in many cases we refer to it as the minimum clinically important difference and it is by definition the smallest difference which would mandate in the absence of serious side effects or excessive cost, a change in scientific practice, okay? So the idea here is um, you have to think about what treatment effect do you need to see or does the field need to see in order for your intervention to be implemented across the across the sites, across the country, okay? So we often say things like, well, if mortality is my endpoint, even a 2% improvement in mortality would be, would be worthwhile, right? But if the intervention is very, very costly, um, if the intervention is very complicated and requires special, either special equipment or special um, expertise to implement, 2% improvement in mortality might not be sufficient for that intervention to be accepted by the community. Or um, if there is inherent harm in the intervention, again, you can think about a surgical procedure. If there is inherent harm in the intervention, a 2% improvement might not be sufficient to warrant risking harm in a large number of patients. Okay, so you really need to think through from a clinical perspective or from a scientific perspective, what is the smallest difference that you expect to change practice? In some disease areas, that has sort of already been decided, okay? I know um, in ischemic stroke, um, most, I don't, I don't want to say all, but many studies that I've seen for ischemic stroke are looking at improvements in favorable outcome as defined by the modified Rankin scale and the minimum clinically relevant difference 
that is targeted for a phase three clinical trial is 10%. Okay, I don't know what decision went into making that determination um, the first time, but it's something that seems to have been picked up over time. Um, so in your disease area, you may be able to get some understanding of what that difference is from the literature. And the reason it's important is because this plays a huge, has a huge impact on your sample size determination, right? So there's a rule of thumb, which people will spout out, which is the larger the difference you're targeting, the smaller the sample size, okay? That's a little simplistic, um, but for the most part, it's true. And we'll, I'll sort of give you an idea as to why that is, okay? Again, we know under certain assumptions what the distribution of outcomes that we're looking at um, might be. So what I'm gonna show you here are curves representing, instead of the null and the alternative hypothesis, curves that represent a control arm and uh, an intervention arm, okay? So here, I'm showing you the control arm. Let's say we're trying to impact a change in some outcome measure. So under the control arm, nothing is happening. Our curve is a nice normal curve that's centered at zero, right? Um, and under the intervention, we expect a shift to the right, okay? So whatever outcome we've chosen, we're reducing it over time. Now, if I pick, if I observe, let's say, a mean in the intervention group of 0.6, right? That happens, let's see, here's my 0.6. I don't know if you all can see this arrow. Um, it happens quite commonly under the control distribution, but it also happens quite commonly under the assumed distribution for the intervention, right? So if I observe a mean under the intervention of 0.6, I can't be sure, I can't, I can't say with any confidence whether I believe that came from the control distribution or from the in intervention distribution. But as I shift that curve, right, again, here, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, right, now it occurs more commonly under the, actually it occurs about the same, under the control and under the intervention distribution. Now, with my treatment arms so far apart in terms of their center, an observation of a mean of 0.6 happens much more commonly under the null hypothesis than it does under the alternative hypothesis, right? So, or sorry, under the treatment condition than under the intervention condition. So which am I going to believe, right? There's, there's not enough evidence for me if I observe a 0.6, there's, it happens so rarely under the intervention distribution that there's no reason for me to think that that's the distribution that generated that mean, right? And so that's sort of the idea here, again, that as these distributions get further and further apart from each other, um, it's going to be easier to tell them apart. Okay, I see there's a question about rare disorders. Um, so the question is how to consider this when one studies rare disorders. There are, there is a body of literature that is specific to rare disorders because we are often in a position where we can't study a sample that is as large as we need. Um, and so in those cases, we really do need to make the most out of every patient that we have access to. Um, I'm not prepared to talk about the sample size calculations for those, but there, there are, um, there is literature in that area. Okay, so the other factor, um, another factor that weighs into the sample size calculation is the variability that you expect to see in your outcome. And we think about variability in two different ways, okay? If the outcome is continuous, um, so let's say you're studying weight loss, right? Then we estimate the variability differently than if the outcome is categorical. So we're studying mortality. In the continuous case, we need an estimate of the standard deviation or the variance of our outcome measure. Preferably, we have that estimate under both a control assumption and an intervention assumption, um, but we need it absolutely in at least one of those cases, okay? If our outcome is binary or dichotomous, 
what we're really talking about when we're talking about variability is the estimated control rate. So again, in the case of ischemic stroke, what is the proportion of favorable outcomes that I would expect in my control arm? And that gives me the variation um, estimate that I need to compute the sample size. Okay, so this is essentially the graph that I showed you before. And I said, the larger the difference, the smaller the sample size is generally true, but a little simplistic. And it's simplistic because it ignores the contribution of variability. Um, so here you can see if I'm trying to tell the difference between these two distributions, there's a little bit of overlap, but not a ton. And so it might be fairly easy for me to tell the difference. But if I shift the variability, so these two curves, the curves on the right, the red curves are centered at the same place, but I've changed the variability. And now you'll see that there's a fair amount more overlap. And so a value of say one, okay, which happened, or here we'll go here, 0.8, which happens fairly regularly, under the control condition, not terribly often under the intervention condition, when I change the variation, now it happens much more commonly under the intervention condition, not too much differently than how I see it under the control condition. And so again, that change in overlap makes it harder for me to tell the difference between those two curves. Okay. This is um, just an example because I know until you really see in numbers, it can be hard to say, well, how much impact can it really have if my estimate of the variability is off, right? So this is the sample size that's required um, in the top graph, sample size is along the y-axis. The common standard deviation that I've assumed for my two groups is along the x-axis. And I am targeting a minimum clinically important difference of five units. Okay, so in order to achieve 80% power with a standard deviation of five units, I need about 20 subjects per group, 40 subjects total, right? If I'm off on that standard deviation estimate by even two units, so if I go up to seven, my sample size now is closer to 40 subjects per group. Okay, so I'm short essentially 40 subjects over the course of my study. That's a huge difference. Um, if it's a little hard to think about in terms of the sample size, you can think about it instead in terms of the power. Again, I've sized this study so that I have 80% um, power. But for my sample size, if I'm off by one unit, I'm down to less than 70% power. And if I'm down by two units, I'm between 50 and 60% power, okay? So it can make a real difference in terms of your sample size calculation. The same thing is true in terms of a binary outcome. So again, what I've used here is essentially um, the sample size determination for the IMS3 study. So in we assumed a 50% good outcome rate among the control arm, and we were targeting a 10% absolute difference in the proportion of subjects with a favorable outcome. So from 50% to 60%, okay, or from 40% to 50% was actually our assumption, but the sample size is the same. In order to achieve 80% power, you need 408 subjects per group. That's a, that's a pretty large study, right? Um, but if that control proportion is off, so if it's really 30% and you're trying to tell the difference between 30% and 40% good outcome rates, then you need 376 per group. So again, you're gonna be off by 50 subjects over the course of the study. If you're really off and the control proportion is only 20%, then you, on, then you need 313 per group. Now, in this case, in the case of the binomial proportion, the outcome is most variable in this sort of 50% range here, right? You'll see the sample size is maximized when we're going from 50 to 60 or 40 to 50. Um, so in this case, if you target your design here and you wind up being off in this direction, 
um, towards a smaller control proportion, then you're going to have too much power, um, which some might argue is not a bad thing. Um, but again, it gets to that question of resources and whether it's ethical to continue randomizing subjects when you could have answered the question with fewer. Okay, so before asking about sample size, when you come to meet with your statistician, be prepared to talk about what level of significance you want to set, what power you want to target, the expected variability in your response. It's best if this is based on the relevant clinical literature, if you can point to references in the literature that tell you what the variability looks like. If you don't have that, if it's a new outcome or a new procedure, um, you may have uh, pilot data, perhaps from your lab um, or from a pilot study that you've conducted at your clinic. You need at least one estimate, okay? A, a better scenario would be to have a range of plausible values so that you can calculate the sample size under the smallest variation that you might expect and one under the largest variation that you might expect and then go with the sample size, uh, the largest sample size that is feasible. Okay, um, you need to be prepared to talk about the minimum scientifically important difference. Again, that's what's the smallest difference which will change practice. And if the sample size that goes along with that proves that the trial isn't feasible, um, then hopefully there's some room for compromise, either in terms of the difference you're targeting, the power you're, you're targeting and so forth. Um, and the experimental design, right? So the experimental design is going to play a huge role. I've assumed here a superiority study, but there may be other options. For example, um, the use of controls is a place in the experimental design stage where you may be able to make a large impact. So do you really need in your study a concurrent control arm or can you make use of historical controls? Can subjects serve as their own control? Um, if you are able to have subjects serve as their own control, that can make a huge difference. Um, I'm not aware, I, I think Will is on, he might know if there are examples. I'm not aware of examples in neurology where subjects can serve as their own control. Um, but if that's a possibility because of the intervention that you're studying, that's something to think about. There are examples in neurology of trials which use historical controls, and there can be a sample size savings that's associated with that. There are also potential drawbacks that are associated with that, which is in neurology, in some areas of neurology especially, um, changes over time in standard of care, clinical practice, um, treatment possibilities, and so on, may make, um, substantive differences in the historical control data that you have access to versus what you might actually observe in an untreated population currently, okay, or in a population treated currently by standard of care. So that's something that needs to be considered. You might think about whether there are multiple questions which can be answered with the same design. So there are factorial designs which allow you to consider two interventions at the same time. Um, and it allows you then to also answer the question of if you administer those two interventions together, do you get even more benefit than if you administered either of them alone? And this one I wanna stress, especially at the stage that many of you are in right now, um, I'd urge you to consider whether a hypothesis test is really the best way to achieve your objective for your trial, right? So um, in many of the proposals that we've seen over the past couple of years and in the current, uh, my current small group, it is the case that dose is something that we're thinking about, right? It's relatively early in the development stage and we're thinking about what is the relevant dose that we need to move forward. In that case, probably testing a hypothesis that compares the doses to each other is not going to be a very efficient way to go about this, right? Um, it's gonna be harder to detect a difference between two active doses, right? Those curves are gonna be closer together for two active doses than it would be for one active dose versus a control. And so if you're really trying to identify a region where the dose is biologically active, or um, 
even the optimal dose for moving forward, dose finding designs, which are based on identifying doses, are probably going to be a more efficient experimental design for you than a hypothesis test. Um, if you are in a place where you know that there are only two possible doses, um, or there are several interventions and you're not sure which one of them is going to have the best chance of success, again, it might be harder for you to test um, a hypothesis comparing multiple interventions to each other. You might really be interested in selecting one of those to move forward. And you can do that without a hypothesis test. There is what's referred to as a selection design, which uses selection theory to size your study in such a way that you have a high likelihood of choosing the best design correctly. Um, and the sample size savings, again, there can be quite, quite extreme. The last thing I will say is that the sample size calculation depends on the method of analysis. So you need to be prepared to have that conversation um, as well. For example, if you're studying the modified Rankin in ischemic stroke, and I'm sorry to keep coming back to that, but it's, it happens to be what I have the most experience in. If you're going to use the modified Rankin scale as a binary outcome, favorable outcome versus unfavorable outcome, that's going to be a very different analysis and a very different sample size calculation potentially than if you want to use the full range of the ordinal modified Rankin and allow each category to stand on its own. So again, um, things to be prepared to discuss. Regardless, you have to be able to justify and defend the sample size that you're requesting. So you need to be very clear about saying how many subjects are you asking for and be very upfront about saying whether the sample size is adequate for testing the hypothesis. You wanna be very specific about how the sample size was determined because there will be statistical reviewers for your grant. Um, and I don't um, double check the sample size calculation of every grant that I review, but for many areas, I have an idea, a ballpark of what a sample size should be for a given question, right? So I know that a 10% difference in a binary outcome when the control rate is 50% is gonna wind up being eight to 900 subjects for the total trial. So if you give me a sample size that's very different from that, I might actually go try to calculate it. So if you did anything other than the most straightforward, I'm gonna need to know that so I don't bang my head trying to figure out where your numbers came up. Uh, came from. Again, be honest. Do you need more, really? Um, or can you answer questions with fewer? And that may be the case, and that may be okay, but you have to justify it to the reviewer. Approaches for keeping it small. You might want to study a continuous rather than a binary outcome. Um, you might want to study a surrogate outcome where the effect is large. Those can be, uh, can have some sample size savings as well. The approach that I prefer in terms of calculating the sample size is um, listed first here. So I prefer when I meet with investigators for them to come with the difference they want to detect, an estimate of the variability and a target power, and then I go back and compute the sample size that's associated with that. Um, what often happens is that that's a good first step, and then the investigator comes and says, I can't afford that many patients, right? Um, and so then we go about it a little differently. Then I say, okay, you tell me how many you can afford and what power you want and what the variability is, and I'll give you the difference that you can detect with that level of power. But either way, you have to be able to detect, you have to be able to justify that difference and why it's scientifically relevant. There are lots of options for sample size software. Um, there's freeware on the web, and I've provided some links for them. You can purchase software. Um, Inquiry is what I often use. Um, your statistician is going to have lots of options, these and others, available to them. So don't, you know, don't be afraid to um, don't be afraid to have that conversation. There's there's lots of options. Um, however, I love this. I have said this to clinicians who have become friends over the years, so I hope I'm not putting this out there too much, but they're not my words. It's from the Iowa website on the previous slide. 
So a comment on the Iowa website says, I received quite a few questions to start with something like this. I'm not much of a stats person, but I tried blah, blah. Am I doing it right? Please compare this with, I don't know much about heart surgery, but my wife is suffering from blank and I plan to operate. Can you advise me? Okay. Um, there's going to be lots of options available to you and um, it's going to be very easy to use the software, but that's not a guarantee that you've considered everything that you need to consider. And so I really encourage you to meet with the statistician um, early and often and develop that relationship so that you can really have these conversations in detail. The last thing I wanna say is the logistics. Um, so there's a couple of things that you should also think about, but might come at a later conversation which is the recruitment rate is gonna impact the sample size, how likely a treatment crossover might be, whether you expect large amounts of non-adherence to the protocol, and whether your population is um, highly at risk for loss to follow up and consent withdrawal. All of these things might require um, inflation of the sample size in order to power the trial appropriately. Okay. I'll stop. I see there are some questions in the chat window. Okay, so um, Prasha, I hope I'm saying that name correctly, asked, what's a reasonable time frame to initiate sample size calculation discussions with the biostatistician? Should they be involved as we are designing the study or after the design is finalized? Um, so I'll answer that question first. So I don't think you can have the discussion too early. I think once the design, sorry, I'm looking not at the camera. Once the design is finalized, um, it may be too late um, to think through some of the implications of the decisions that you've made. Um, I think it's often the case that we can come up with a very complicated experimental design for which calculating the sample size is extremely difficult or the analysis plan is extremely convoluted. Um, and so I don't think there is a too early point. I think most statisticians want to be involved as early as possible. And that is especially true if you're trying to develop a collaboration relationship where they are going to work with you on the grant proposal, they're going to work with you on the implementation of the trial, and they're going to work with you on the analysis. Um, the second question, when designing a confirmatory study, effect sizes are usually available. When planning an early phase, effect sizes are often not available and may not exactly reflect this or be the same as the question of interest. Yes, that is true. So I think um, for early phase studies, phase two in particular, um, depending on what your approach is, whether you're looking at a biomarker, whether you're looking at um, a surrogate outcome, it may not be easy to come up with the minimum scientifically important difference. Um, you may, however, be able to say, so I mentioned earlier a futility study, so you may be able to say that if the effect that you've observed is less than something, then you're obviously not interested in considering it anymore. Um, and I would also, again, say that it may not be that a hypothesis test is always what you're going for, right? If you're really trying to select doses or select a dose to move forward, um, a hypothesis test that's based on a scientifically important difference between active doses is going to be very difficult, whereas the selection design um, might be a little more relevant. Um, I don't know, Will, I see you now down there, if you have anything you want to say about that. I I just um, added that in general, I, if somebody's giving you the advice to use a small trial to estimate the effect size for a large trial, it's not good advice. Um, and it, it's explicitly banned on the NINDS website. Like if you propose a phase two trial to estimate the effect size for a subsequent phase three trial, um, they'll say no. Um, so I think. The idea is what would be the, I think going back to what Sharon says, what's scientifically meaningful? And if, if it's a situation where there's variability, if you have a, a, a continuous outcome, um, then learning about the variability can be very helpful because that's a major parameter in what a real sample size might be in the future trial. Or learning about the baseline event rate 
if it's a more binary outcome, because that can have big implications. You know, comparing some comparing a treatment that has a five uh, percent event rate versus a ten percent event rate is very different from a forty-five uh, percent event rate versus a fifty percent event rate. So I think knowing what is is sort of you know understanding more about variability can be helpful, but um, the effect size comes from us as clinicians as to what would be meaningful in the disease. Unfortunately, there's always a little bit of back calculation of that and to say that, well, nobody's going to fund a trial greater than some sample size of 1,500. So the minimal cl you know, clinically significant effect size is 8 to 9%. And that's, you know, there, there are problems with that as well. I mean, I think, you know, depending on the, the noxiousness of the treatment or the safety and cost of the treatment, there would be situations where we'd be very happy with smaller effect sizes, and it's just a matter of creating a design that can get you an adequate sample size to do that. So I think you have to think about what would be meaningful to move science forward, um, but it's uh, it can be um, it just should be careful. You you want to learn, you want to learn proof of concept if you can, um, but and you may want to learn what is a, a range of sample sizes for a subsequent trial or effect sizes for a, a, a you know future trial that is within a range of plausibility but not like come up with a specific number because that's um the, the smaller the smaller the trial the more unstable the estimate okay there's one more question um amit maybe said asked do you have suggestions for literature to learn about dose finding testing um, so dose finding is usually done without hypothesis testing. It's often done in a um, either an algorithmic or a model-based sort of approach. But yes, I do. If you will, um, I don't know. Can I post links here, or should I? What will? How do you want me to put that stuff out there? It may be simplest just to send an email to the. Um, the, the we have an email that will email the whole cohort um, okay. that way. Um, okay. If you if you email it to me or Jenna, we can forward it to the list, or I can just send you the okay. email address. I think you might not be able, you might not, you're probably not on that list though, so you might not have the right to post. So if you just send it to me or Jenna, we can send it. Okay, I will do that. I think the other thing is we're going to be covering that um, in some of the sessions in um, in Ann Arbor. Uh, you know, again, I think the the there you you can certainly review the literature about. There are various ways that it can be done, including fancy adaptive designs or, um, you know, continual reassessment method, which is a adaptive design that is decently fancy. It, it, they require a lot more upfront work from the statistician. So this is one of the things about: is it ever too early to talk to a statistician? If you're in the dose, um, if you if you're interested in the dose ranging space, I think it's a very valuable conversation to have with them. And but it's a uh, just sort of depending on how the academic structure works, it will be a you know a bit of work for them. So if there's something through CTSAs or you have some sort of design core so that they actually have some time that's bought from your university to be helping you with the planning, those can be good good things because if it's if it's sort of the aspirational like, well, we're working on this grant, I mean that's fine. People will work with you. We're, there are a lot of collaborators in science, but just recognize that compared to a, you know, even the, you know, the 500 million, you know, 30,000 patient trial that's comparing two things is infinitely easy. You know, could the, the statistician may be able to design that in, um, you know, much less time than it will take you to get the really good, careful dose ranging study of of 20 patients. So it's uh, it, it, it's one of those things where that while that is counterintuitive, um, it is absolutely true. Okay, other questions? I think, I don't know, did you cover the one about uh, rare disorders? Yeah, I don't have a good answer for the, the, the one about rare disorders. So there is a body of literature available. Um, I'm not an expert by any means in um, power and sample size considerations for rare disorders. Um, it is a, it's a very complicated problem is all I can really say. The willingness, depending on how rare, um, the willingness for the FDA and the scientific community to accept carefully followed and rigorously studied historical controls is usually um, 
you know, usually that's a, a potential option, particularly if measures of, if it's a chronic disease, measures of disease progression, those sorts of things are well established. Altering the progression of a chronic disease, if you know well what the, um, if, if you can well document from a prospectively collected cohort of people, what has been going on with that disease, that rare disease um, is, is sometimes an option. And, and it's, there's some innovative stuff going on in that space. You know, it's not something that people are gonna pull off the shelf though. And there's an office of rare diseases at, at, at NIH, of course, and they're, they're, they um, may be able to do matchmaking and those sorts of things. But you know, the bottom line is that historical controls may be an option depending on the context, the disease, and the um, awesomeness of the historical controls. I think with that, um, you know, Sharon, thank you very much for another excellent presentation. Um, we will look forward to seeing you here in August, and we hope everybody continues to have uh, good uh, progress with their protocols, and hope everybody has a good afternoon. I just want to remind everybody, if you are interested in CMEs, I posted the link again in, in the chat box, you can either click on it or you can copy and paste it into um, a search. Um, and then our next webinar will be on Friday, July 15th at noon Eastern Standard Time. The topic will be creating a budget for a single site clinical trial. All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Thank Sharon. You. Thanks, guys. Take care.